Good afternoon. I think it's officially afternoon. Yep. <laughs> uh, welcome everybody to the uh, our Sonoma County May virtual farmers market. Uh, thanks so much for coming. My name is Pat and I am today's moderator and a graduate of the 2005 Master Gardener class. We are so happy you're here with us today. Uh, we have a very full and interesting session today uh, with some special guest speakers, and we will also be answering your questions. A uh, few ground rules before we get started. Uh, we ask that everybody mute your audio and turn off your video. Uh, if you wanna ask a question, please use the chat box to type in any questions you may have. Um, and also remain muted unless we would ask you to unmute to clarify maybe a question that we may have. Um, and uh, also today's session will be recorded. So if this is of concern to you, you might wanna leave the session and watch the recording later on the uh, Master Gardener uh, YouTube when it's posted. Um, the Sonoma County Master Gardener Organization has been serving home gardeners here in Sonoma County for almost 40 years. Uh, we are an organization of volunteers who have been trained by uh, UC Davis. And our mission is to use the most current research-based information to help all home gardeners to find answers to their many diverse gardening questions. Um, in addition, I want you to know we are attaching a link in the chat box to a PDF with a list of resources related to today's session. Um, if you have something like an iPad or another tablet, you can click on the link and then download the PDF. Um, also, the other option is when today's video is posted on YouTube, you can also find the link in the comment section by that video. Uh, for any real-time questions we get today in the chat box, we will also try to post links uh, related to them in the chat area. Um, okay, I think uh, we're ready to go. So in addition to answering your questions, we have a special program today that is so near and dear to my heart. Um, May is National Garden for Wildlife Month. And we have speakers that will focus on birds, butterflies, and native plants uh, in your landscape. So. First, I want to introduce uh, our three special speakers for today. Uh, our first speaker, Mary Ellen, became a master gardener in 2014. She is a certified California naturalist. She volunteers at the Bird Rescue Center, which is still located at the original site in Santa Rosa, and in the rehab hospital and resident raptor programs and is a member of National Audubon and Cornell Lab of Ornithology. Mary Ellen completed a graduate program in the School of Natural Resources at Humboldt. Our next speaker, Suzanne, became a master gardener in Maryland in 2008, specializing in wildlife habitat, integrated pest management, and storm water management. After she moved to Petaluma in 2012, she took the training again to become a master gardener here in Sonoma County. Suzanne's main interest is to share her passion for saving habitats for butterflies and other, and other pollinators. Excuse me. Suzanne has been fostering butterflies and monitoring the flight of monarchs for Monarch Watch for over 20 years. Our third speaker, Guma, became interested in gardening through working on habitat restoration projects with several environmental groups. She became a master gardener in 2014. Her garden is her experiment on native plant gardening in microzones, but she has also delved into soil and soil restoration. She started her garden from scratch in a highly habitat unfriendly back and front yards. So what we're gonna to do today is first, we're gonna hear from our speakers and then we'll get to the rest of your questions. So let's begin today's uh, session by uh, asking our speakers, starting with Guma, why it is important to preserve wildlife in our habitat. Guma? 
Well, take a good look at California and let's talk about what makes it special. Um, first of all, it's a Mediterranean climate and there are only five in the world. And those five all together make up less than 2% of the world's uh, land surface, but they contain more biodiversity than any other biome except for the rainforest. And now besides that, if you look at California, the, the circle of the mountains and the desert make it like an island. Maybe you might have heard this, that most of the extinctions that are taking place take place on islands. And the reason for that is that those species are endemic to that. They have a lot of endemic species in the, in the island and they can't get out of it. Um, and they have a very, so they have a very limited range. In California, if a plant or an animal tries to move or migrate, it's gonna run into mountains or desert or a radical environmental, uh, a radical change of environment. So next slide. Uh, take a look at the plant communities of Californians. You see even more diversity. Uh, California is the most diverse of any state in the union. It has an incredible variety of biomes in it. And when the plants in it are threatened, all the life that depends on them are threatened. Go on. Okay. <laughs> okay, thanks, Guma. Um, let me ask Mary Ellen or Suzanne, would you like to add anything? Sure, I'll be happy to add something, Pat. Um, I would just say that birds are probably one of the best indicators of environmental health and healthy bird populations sing signal a healthy ecology. Uh, Cal Fish and Game has identified 74 bird species of special concern in California. Um, these haven't been listed and or given any kind of official um, conservation status, but nonetheless, they're very at risk. and. Bird species that are protected and listed as threatened and endangered often provide the only legal means that we have to protect dwindling habitat. For example, uh, the, the protection that's been given to the marbled merlet and to the spotted owl, that's all that stands in the way of the destruction of our West Coast old, old growth forests. Okay. Um, I would like to add that pollinators and native plants um, are perfect together because they have co-evolved. So they actually add, um, they actually help each other. So they're mutually beneficent. And I'll speak more about that when I'm, um, when I give my presentation. Okay, thank you guys. Um, I think first we're gonna start with Mary Ellen and birds. So Mary Ellen, please help us understand how we can protect and grow our bird population. Okay, thanks, Pat. Um, welcome, everyone. Thanks for being here and for your interest in habitat gardening. I'm going to talk about this from the perspective of birds. But first, let's take a look at the foot footprint of urban and suburban areas. They're increasing all over the uh, globe. And as they expand, they're constantly altering and destroying natural areas. So for birds, th there's never been such a, a lack or short supply of um, good habitat. But this doesn't mean that for you and me, where we live, we can't provide home for wildlife. Um, by creating gardens, we can bring an oasis in for birds and bring it right to the heart of our community. And not only would the birds benefit, but um, you'll also see more birds and more variety of birds in your um, yard. So we really need to create functional ecosystems now in our neighborhoods. This, this isn't an option for us anymore. So, uh, Gardening for birds um, and wildlife is probably one of the easiest kinds of bird, uh, gardening that you can do. For birds in particular, uh, the best way to go about this is to think like a bird. So what do, you, what do they need? They need food, water, and shelter. Food, obviously you can put up a uh, feeder, but a better choice would be to select trees and shrubs that fruit and flower at different times throughout the year so that you're providing food for native birds as well as for those migrants that maybe come through once or twice a year. But when they visit your yard, they're gonna find the fuel that they need to resupply and restock and be able to continue on their migration. Water is obviously very essential to birds and 
providing a bird bath, having um, running water in some form really attracts birds. And then shelter is so critical. If you're putting up feeders, you want to have some shelter, a tree or shrub or something really fairly close by so that they can escape uh, predators or when they feel threatened. And of course, those um, plants will also provide um, roosting spots overnight, perching spots, nesting spots. So um, anything that you do will really uh, help a lot. And the reason this is all so important is because um, according to the International Union of Concerned Scientists, they have a red list. And we now know that 23% of the world's birds are either threatened or threatened uh, with near extinction. And 44% uh, of our bird populations are declining. Um, in 2019 in the United States, the journal Science published a very in-depth report that indicated that we have lost since 1970, we've lost close to 3 billion birds. So we really need to slow this loss of, um, of birds and the impact that it's having on destroying all these ecological processes. And slowing this biodiversity is probably one of the most important um, challenges that we have in the 21st century. Um, next slide. Uh, as a birder, as sort of budding ornithologist, and for many people who like birds, you know, trying to put an economic value on birds may seem a little off-putting, but the fact of the matter is, is that birds really are very important and can add an awful lot to the gross domestic product. What do birds do that's so important? Seed dispersal and pollination of plants and crops. Um, here in Sonoma County, we've had such a tremendous loss of habitat because of the many wildfires that we've had and continue to have. Birds are really critical in seed dispersal in those areas. Um, another important function that birds have is pest control. Um, if you're adding a more plant material and more um, opportunities for insects, you're going to have more insects, but guess what? You're also gonna have more birds that are gonna come in and glean those insects. Um, another example of pest control is if you consider a barn owl, a barn owl can eat in its lifetime 11,000 mice. And those um, mice, potentially could consume as much as 13 tons of crops. Um, another control that uh, raptors can help with is um, diverting uh, bird species that might be problematical like starlings or geese on airports. They're now using raptors to disperse those birds so that they don't uh, collide with airlines. Um, and then scavengers. Um, most people don't like to talk or particularly like turkey vultures, but uh, they have evolved uh, some very interesting um, capacities uh, for not only cleaning up the environment, but um, because they are not impacted by the pathogens, they don't spread the pathogens either. So very quickly, next slide, what can we do um, ourselves? There's so many things that you've probably heard about, but for birds and from a bird's perspective, these are extremely important. The first of those, of course, is really protecting your windows and making them safe. Window strikes kill so many birds, not only at, at people's homes, but also in high rise buildings. Um, keep your kitties indoors. They're gonna be a lot healthier. And we know that birds kill millions of birds. I mean, cats kill millions of birds every year. Um, of course, you want to reduce the use of plastics. 91% of our plastics aren't recycled. And we know that certain kinds of plastics can take 400 years to degrade. Obviously, you also want to um, uh, do some citizen science if you're interested in that. Uh, the data that you can contribute to things like eBird and some other uh, sources. That's the data that scientists have been able to use to be able to very accurately um, understand this tremendous loss of birds that we've had. Um, you like coffee? Drink coffee, but drink shade grown coffee. It really makes a difference. It makes a difference for the farmers that are growing that way and for the increased number of songbirds and especially your um, migrating birds that come from, in our case, Central America and South America. 
Um, it goes without saying that you don't want to use pesticides, herbicides, insecticides, and also especially rodenticides, which impact a lot of raptors. And um, most important for our discussion today is to um, use native plants. And gardening, if you have a window box or if you've got a, next slide, Cleo, if you've got a gigantic backyard, the plants that you choose can really, really make a difference. Um, again, you'll not only be attracting more birds, but you'll be attracting a larger variety of birds. Um, mounting evidence has really shown that native plants uh, support more insect life than non-native plants. And these birds that come into your yard then to glean on those um, seeds and flowers and things, the seed dispersal that they'll be doing off of native plants is much more beneficial than if they're uh, spreading seeds of some of the more invasive and non-native species that we have in our environment. So overall, you know from Master Gardeners, we encourage you to reduce or eliminate your lawn and to you know, consider using these um, native plants. And of course, we're gonna talk more about that today. But um, I would also say that, you know, sometimes doing nothing is even a good idea. For instance, if you have a tree in your backyard that's dead, and it's not threatening your home in any way, consider that that's really important habitat for birds. It provides roosting, nesting, and also uh, sources of food for obviously woodpeckers, but also a lot of other insect eating birds. So thanks for your time. Happy to answer questions later and um, happy gardening with native plants. Thank you. <laughs> thanks so much, Mary Ellen, but you don't get off the hook that easy. I okay. have some questions for you. Sure. <laughs> First question, and I think that this was on everybody's mind this winter. This past winter, there was a lot of news about bird bass transmitting disease to finches. Should we be removing bird bass, bird feeders? Um, at this particular time now, uh, the answer is no. If you have removed them, you can put them back up. Um, what was going on was that um, we had a tremendous outbreak of salmonella. And what happens out in uh, the environment is sometimes you have what's called an eruption of a particular species of birds. In our particular case, what happened is that um, pine siskins, which live up in the boreal forest, came in because um, there was a crash in their food sources. So uh, pine siskins are particularly vulnerable to salmonella. And when birds um, congregate collectively, either at feeders or at uh, bird baths, that pathogen can be very, very quickly um, passed not only between the uh, pine siskins, but other birds that congregate at those feeders. At bird rescue by early January, we already had 150 um, dead birds coming in, mostly pine siskins. So throughout the, the most of the winter now, um, we've been telling people to take their feeders down, take their bird baths down. Um, now it, the, the pine siskins have um, migrated back out of the area. So it's okay at this point to put those feeders back up. But the cautionary note is that you need to clean your feeders and your bird baths every week. You should refresh the water in your feet in your bath every um, day. Your feeders should be cleaned every week, and that includes hummingbird feeders. Um, it's pretty simple to do. Take them down. Maybe have an alternative feeder you can put up while you're cleaning the other one. Uh, soap and water, and then a nine to one um, water with bleach for about ten and fifteen minutes, soaking your feeders and your bird bath, and then rinse it thoroughly and put it back up again. So clean, clean, clean your feeders at all times, your bird baths at all times throughout the year. This really helps reduce pathogens, not only for the wildlife, but in that rare instance that it could pass to uh, humans also. Okay, thanks. Next question for you. <laughs> Should we be using hummingbird feeders to supplement natural sources? Uh, it's certainly okay to put up hummingbird feeders. Um, it's fun to watch our native um, Anna hummingbird. Um, we know their males are very territorial. And, um, you know, in the breeding season, which we're, we're deep in baby bird season now, it starts like the hummers are some of the first uh, birds to uh, breed. 
and hatch out their little ones starting in March. Um, but they we're deep in baby bird season. So during that time, um, birds will seek out the supplemental sh uh, sugar water. But the reality is, is that um, hummingbirds actually eat a huge number of arthropods, um, spiders and other insects. I've seen them catch it on the wing. So um, it's for your enjoyment and it's okay to have them up for uh, hummingbirds. Don't use that icky red stuff. It doesn't do them any good or you any good um, and you don't need it. Um, four to one sugar water, boiling water, let it cool down, put it in your feeders, but clean those feeders. <laughs> Thanks. All right, another one. What do I do if I find a bird nest in my roof eaves? I would say first and foremost, probably do nothing unless uh, the, if it's a nest with nestlings, nestlings are the little babies with no feathers. Um, if it's under any kind of threat from a cat or um, some other source, you could try rescuing those birds. Um, it's preferable to leave wildlife alone. Even during baby bird season up at Bird Rescue, we do a lot to discourage people from bringing in nestlings. Um, if they fall out, put them back in the nest. If there's no nest, you can make a nest with a little basket and um, some tissue paper. Um, fledglings, leave them alone. Generally, the parents are around and keeping eyes on them. But um, the best thing if it's in your eve and the bird isn't being threatened, the birds aren't being threatened, leave it alone. Okay, um, one of the pre-submitted questions we got from Mary, she asks, very large blackbirds, either crows or ravens, keep small songbirds away from my bird bath and bird feeder, what to do? Um, well, I am sorry to say there's not much that you can or should do. Um, all birds, with only a few exceptions of not some non-native birds, all birds are protected and you really need to just leave them alone. Um, crows, ravens, blue jays are in a family called corvids, um, not covids, but corvids. And they are some of the smartest birds. Um, they've been tested in ways where they perform better than chimpanzees. Um, so they'll learn your face. And um, you know if you shoo them away, they might possibly stay away, but um, as far as putting up anything mechanical or doing anything that discourages them, they don't really feed on, well, they do feed on some eggs, but um, generally the advice is just to leave that situation alone. They okay. were here first. <laughs> I will say, which I was kind of made because I have a redwood where they're nesting right now. And they left me a whole donut in my bird bath the other day. <laughs> and I didn't know if they were trying to thank me, annoy me, but I wanted to also tell them they're giving their kids a really bad diet. But anyway, <laughs> um, there were a few more questions that have appeared in the chat on about birds, but I think what we're gonna do is move on to our next speaker and then we'll get back to it after um, we get through. So thank you very much, Mary Ellen. I think we wore you out. No, um, that's fine, thank you. So Mary, <laughs> Mary Ellen has told us about the necessity of birds in our landscape. So now we're gonna to turn to butterflies. Suzanne, I know your garden supports a lot of butterflies. So please tell us what we need to know about butterflies. Oh, thank you very much. Um, I'm going to screen share now. And um, so, okay, here we go. Insects are dying at an alarming rate. It's hard to say exactly how many because, because of their, um, excuse me, I've got to just move this over a little bit. Okay, there we go. Um, it's hard to say exactly how many because 80% of the insects have yet to be described by taxonomists, but probably about 5.5 million species. 40% of our insect populations have seen declines in recent years and will drop even more without immediate action. What happens to the natural world if all insects disappear? The role allotted to all these tiny creatures in the grand scheme of nature is to eat and be eaten. When insect numbers decrease, everything higher up in the food web will suffer. 
This is already happening. But scientists say there is hope. Let's look at one insect in particular, monarch butterfly. Monarch butterflies, the critically low numbers indicate the monarch overwintering population is a mere 100 percent of its historic size, one hundredth of its historic size. If you look at that little number, that little zero, or that little square down there, rectangle, there's 2,000 in total for the whole of California coast this last year. You may be a little bit confused by this graph because you see this larger uh, number up here. That is a number of volunteer monarch counters that are at a historic level, which is, um, you know, I am one of those which means we go out um, to count the number of monarch butterflies before Christmas and after Christmas. And we, the numbers of people doing it is very high, but nevertheless, the numbers of monarch butterflies is at a critically low state. So for example, Pismo Beach, a lot of people like to go to um, Monarch Grove there. In the 1990s, there were 230,000. In 2016, the numbers had dr drastically reduced. And if you notice how they've gone down and down, and do you know this last winter, there was less than 200. So how are monarchs threatened? Climate change creates living conditions, temperature and pre precipitation levels that are unpredictable. Overwintering habitat loss and degradation in California and new development sites near overwintering groves. Loss of milkweed due to habitat conversion and adverse land management, that's destruction of their homes. Lack of early blooming nectar plants that the monarch adults need when they leave their roosting site in spring. Drought conditions in the Western US results in fewer native milkweed plants late in the summer when monarchs should be breeding, and neonicotoids, insecticides, and herbicide use poisons all insects. How you can help. Plant California native milkweed for monarch caterpillars. Plant early flowering nectar plants for monarch butterflies leaving overwintering sites. Urge plant nurseries to avoid selling plants sprayed with neonicotoids. And these are systemic, which means they go into the plant and they, they don't ever leave. Encourage public land managers to create wildflower butterfly habitats near agricultural fields or along public highways. Create wildlife corridors to link habitats through human development. Do not buy monarch butterflies that were mass bred, such as for weddings, as this practice could easily transmit disease. Become a citizen scientist and report your monarch sightings. If you see a monarch, uh, take a picture. Don't worry if it can be far away or blurry. If it is tagged, like that one there, contact the email address on the tag and let the tagger know that you have found their butterfly. And you, what kind of garden do you have? Do you have a caterpillar garden, a butterfly garden, or a caterpillar and butterfly garden. The anatomies of caterpillars and butterflies are different. That is to say, all caterpillars, no matter what they look like, if they're fuzzy or furry or prickly or in intense, um, massed together, whatever, all of them have a mouth and a jaw to chew leaves and flowers. While all butterflies and here again, no matter what they look like around the world, color or size, all of them sip nectar from flowers through a proboscis. And you can see that little curly um, attachment on their body. This is how they get their nectar. They have no mouth parts. So unlike the caterpillar, they have no mouth parts. So if the anatomies of caterpillars and butterflies are so very different, then it makes sense that they eat different foods. And that's what they do. The challenge is butterflies require specific host plants for their caterpillars to feed on. In other words, adult butterflies can mate, 
But if a mother butterfly with an ovary full of eggs does not find her specific host plant, there will be no laying of eggs, no new caterpillars, and no new butterflies. Their mother will die with an ovary full of eggs. If butterflies only lay eggs on specific host plants, how do we know which plants they need? Well, this is where we can help as a master gardener. So where do we start? Here's a monarch butterfly laying eggs on my, my native milkweed. You can see it will go from one um, flower head or leaf to another. It lays its eggs on the underside of a plant and then it will go to another side. And so, as you know, probably monarch milk uh, butterflies lay their eggs on, mil on milkweed. Go fritillary, on the other hand, lay their eggs on passion vine. And here you can see in my garden, the gull fritillary laying eggs very often on the underside. And, and what's so fascinating about the gull fritillary, they sometimes lay their eggs on the, the uh, ten tentacles that come out, the tendrils. So which nectar plants do pollinators like best? Native, of course. And you're, all, you're gonna hear that from all of us. And the reason is plants and pollinators have co-evolved with each other in a symbiotic way to supply each other with the necessities of life. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Suzanne. You didn't think you were going to get off easy, did you? I have some questions for you too. Okay, thank you. <laughs> First question. I have had trouble growing pipe vine that is a food source for pipe vine swallowtails. Where should this be planted? Well, thank you for asking that. I've done that myself just recently because I'm creating a, a pipe vine um, a corridor here in Petaluma. And um, the thing about pipe vine, you can you grow it in, you know, in a place that has some sun and some shade. And it is a vine, it grows low on the ground. And the thing that's so interesting about pipe vine is that it will, um, you know, they have the saying that the first year it sleeps, the second year it creeps, and the third year it leaves. So it grows slowly and then it takes off. And the thing that's so interesting about the pipe vine butterfly she will only lay their eggs if there's a lot of leaves. And that's because she lays her e uh, eggs in a mass. She'll have, you know, 10 eggs or so in one little cluster. She'll lay one egg after the other. And so they eat a lot of pipe vine. And so she will only lay her eggs where there is um, a lot of leaves. So if you don't have a lot of leaves, you may not get her actually laying the eggs on your pipe vine. Okay, thank you. I will say I'm in Hillsburg and I found the magical place is where the plant gets morning sun but afternoon shade. So anyway, <laughs> my two cents worth. I moved it three times. So I, uh, <laughs> um, all right, next question. I have heard that there are two different milkweeds for butterflies. What is the difference? Well, that's a really good question and it's a hugely complicated question. And that's because wherever you find uh, milkweed or wherever you find monarchs, you'll find milkweed. And you remember, monarchs um, migrate from Canada. And um, you might know too that there, there are Eastern monarchs who live east of the continental divide more or less, and Western monarchs who live on the opposite side, on the west side of the continental divide. And because there's so many different climates in the United States, you're gonna find a lot of different milkweeds. So in the desert, you'll have desert milkweed. You know, in swampy areas, you might have swamp milkweed. Now here in California and Sonoma County, we have five different native milkweeds. And, um, you know, as master gardeners, we, we agree with scientists that the, main, the most important uh, milkweed to plant are native ones. And the ones that you hear about most in um, Sonoma County are the native, um, the uh, narrow leaf, which is called Asclepias fascicularis. And the other one is Asclepias speciosa, which is showy milkweed. 
And so um, those are the two that you see the most often, but they're actually quite tricky to grow from seeds. And, um, but as with, with climate change, we're gonna be seeing that other uh, California native milkweeds may actually be quite um, good in Sonoma County because there's some that are coastal. Now, probably what you're thinking of is about the tropical milkweed. And tropical milkweed is the one that you can find very often in all of, um, you know, all of the different nurseries in Sonoma County. And the thing about the tropical, it's magnificent. I actually have some in my garden, but you have to be very careful with that because um, if you allow, because the thing is the tropical milkweed will not die down easily in the winter. And Dr. Art Shapiro at UC Davis has suggested that if we cut down the tropical milkweed um, four times during the growing season and have it completely down by October, we'll be okay. Otherwise, there is a very terrible disease, OE, that we find in milkweed. And it is one that is transmitted by an adult butterfly that's infected that can fly to a healthy milkweed and contaminate it. So that's that's a very complicated, and I, I do other talks that go in more detail, but that gives you an idea. Native is always best. Okay. Um, I think again, we'll postpone some of the questions for after we get through Guma. And so I'm gonna now move on to, um, a discussion of the native plants and their role in creating habitat garden. So Guma, can you tell us about the necessity of having native plants in your garden and how do we get started if we wanna make our gardens habitat friendly? Well, first of all, there's native plants support a much greater number and variety of species than introduced species of plants do. Doug Tallamy, a scientist who studies these things, and he made this graph, tells us that native oaks, which is the long bar on the far left of the, uh, of the graph, native oaks will support hundreds of species, while the ginkgo tree supports only one and the crepe myrtle none. Um, the non-native species are down at the right side there of the, of the graph. Now, if you're starting a garden from scratch, next advance the slide, there we go. This is, this is what I started from and that, that scratch. Um, you may or may not have to treat the soil before starting a garden. Native soils are perfect for native plants, but a lot of soils have been degraded either by compression from construction work, heavy machinery, by weed cloth, uh, because there were lawns there that were drenched in herbicides or pesticides, for instance, it may have killed the soil underneath. So you may have to treat the soil. You don't have to buy soil. You can treat the soil with compost, with mycorrhizal inoculum, with deep root cover crops, anything that's natural to revive the soil organisms and aerate the soil. But you don't want to till it. That will actually kill the uh, the soil organisms. Use mulch for water retention and always cover the soil with something, plants or mulch or ground cover. Let the plants die where they live and don't rake away the leaves. Although if you have giant leaves like sycamore leaves or something, it helps to shred them so that they break down faster. Hey, thanks. And I have some questions for you. So we'll get through a few and see where we are time-wise and then you know, maybe we'll get to all of them. Uh, they're also in the chat box. So uh, first question, what happens in a native garden in the winter? Well, California seasons are not like seasons in the rest of the country. W winter is rainy season. Plants start to come back. Some plants bloom and it's important to have year round bloom in your garden to support the birds and insects. In my garden, I have a chaparral currant that's in full bloom in December. And these manzanitas are also early blooming along with the currants. With native plants, it's possible to have a succession of plants that bloom at different times so that some food is always available. Okay. Oh, sorry. <laughs> uh, 
I was going to go on to how we select data plants for the garden. Uh, well, why don't you go through the next two slides? Because what I'm trying to show here is although everything blooms, blooms in the springtime, you can also get native plants that bloom in the middle of summer or at the end of summer in the fall. Keep going. You can, oh, you can stay there on the slide. No, go back. I'm sorry. <laughs> and, and go, there we go. Keep going. Okay, stop there. All right. So how do you select native plants for the garden? You ask yourself, what kind of plant community am I in? You may have to do a little research here. When I talk about plant communities, I'm talking about chaparral or redwood forest or scrub or oak woodland or mixed woodland. Um, native plants grow in communities and they're linked underground by mycorrhizal fungal networks. And that's partly how they survive the dry summers. The type of plant community that you have is determined by the sun orientation, the soil type, the water availability, whether or not it's touched by fog and similar factors. So that's why you can't change the underlying plant community. If you try to plant something that doesn't fit, it probably won't grow well or it will need a lot of attention. Now that doesn't mean that everything that does grow well is, uh, is a native. Uh, we have a, an awful lot of invasive weeds and like eucalyptus trees, they grow bigger here than they grow in their native Australia because they don't have any natural enemies here. So nurseries can help you find native plants, especially nurseries like Calflora that specialize in native plants because a lot of the common nurseries and hardware stores don't really know very much about them. You may uh, be able to take advantage of microclimates in your garden. The home, no, go back, please. This, thank you. The homeowners association behind my house planted a line of redwood trees. Just terrible landscaping choice because lands, redwoods don't grow in straight lines. They grow in circles so that they create their own climate from the fog. But they're already there. So I planted redwood understory plants underneath them and they, those plants thrive. So that's like the chaparral in the back. I mean, sorry, the, the current in the background. Now in the foreground, you see a plant that is getting more sun. So there I'm planting chaparral plants, um, coastal chaparral. And in the front of my house, I substituted a meadow for a lawn. You're gonna ask the next Okay. Um, yeah, what, I'm, what I think I'm gonna do now, there's been some questions that have come up in the chat that I'm going to address because I wanna make sure we get uh, their questions answered. And I'm gonna direct it to the people. Uh, we've got some habitat can I, questions. Can I finish my presentation first? Uh, yeah, just because time-wise we're getting short, but uh, yeah, go ahead. Um, all right, let me ask you another question then. Is it only the seeds that provide food or the insects that the plants host as well? The insects are essential to the birds, even seed eating birds. They will feed insects and caterpillars to their young because they need a lot of protein. Okay, um, how do natives get pollinated? Now you can move on the slides to the buckeye. Um, the insects and the plants evolve together, so the native plants will attract a greater variety of bees and other pollinators. California buckeye, which is blooming everywhere right now, is poisonous to non-native bees, but a feast for native bees, which are immune to their toxins in the same way that Native Americans of California are, are immune to poison oak, while the rest of us aren't. And the native bees are much more effective pollinators. Okay, um, I'm gonna combine these two. First of all, do natives need summer watering? And if so, how do we provide water that is so necessary? It's important to follow nature's lead. Of course, nature is all messed up right now because of uh, climate change. So we have drought in the winter sometimes. If it doesn't rain in the winter, you have to water. Um, if it doesn't rain when it normally does. 
you start stretching out the watering cycle in the spring and water little or none by late summer and fall. Some native plants can even be killed by too much water in the summer, especially chaparral plants. Okay, thank you so much. Um, and you mentioned about providing water, right? For the, if we have to yeah, provide the, it. The next slide is a slide of my water feature, but that's not for watering the garden. That's, uh, it does function as a bird bath, but it, it was, intended uh, mainly as a, a design feature and to have some water in the garden. I have a drip system to water the plants. So go on with the question. Okay, thanks. Thanks so much, Guma. Um, I'm going to go to some of the people to, to work on some of the questions because uh, first of all, I want to thank our presenters so much and but I'm still going to pepper them with some questions here. Um, one of the questions that showed up and you know, uh, one of our researchers provided a link but was how to make windows safe for birds. And Mary Ellen, I, you know, you're probably the good candidate for that. Uh, yeah, that's a really uh, interesting and difficult question. Um, certainly what's happening is that birds see the reflection of uh, plants in the sky um, in your windows and they think I can go there. And what they end up doing is hitting the window and of course getting knocked out. Um, you may or may not have had the experience of hearing a bird um, fall like that. And uh, you really should take them to bird rescue because they can get concussed and um, there, there can be brain damage. So it's a good idea to get them in when that happens. Um, you can go to the bird rescue website for how to safely uh, capture the bird, put it in a box and get it to them. As far as diverting birds, um, you know, I, I would suggest you walk around your house at different times of the day and just see if you can see a reflection. Having um, shutters on your window might help. Um, there are these um, things that are being sold, um, decals, if you will, that you can put on the windows. Presumably the birds uh, see those. Th there's not a lot of good science behind that. Uh, it is being researched. And um, they're trying to understand better how birds actually perceive. Birds are very visually acute, but, and some of them see in the UV um, and in spectrum that's beyond what we see. But uh, as far as really good hard science on all of these devices that um, may or may not work, um, I would use that with some caution, but Mostly just try to, you could hang string in front of your windows, you could put shutters on, you could put a shade on, but just kind of be aware of where in your yard and your windows, what time of the day, and of course that changes through the year, um, you've got those bright reflections and uh, try to um, put something in front of the windows, at least for that time of the day, uh, that might help the birds. Okay, thanks. Um, another question maybe for you is uh, from Alan. I want to identify the birds in my yard and area. Is there a source that has a list with pictures of what birds we have in my city? And someone had mentioned the Audubon app. Um, yeah, actually one of the best apps that uh, if you're new to birding and um, there's a free app that you can download from either Cornell Lab of Ornithology, or I think some of the stores also carry it. It's called Merlin, M-E-R-L-I-N. You can either think of that as Merlin the Magician or Merlin the Bird. But Merlin, um, you have to have your locator on. And what it's doing is you put in some um, parameters. You put in uh, some colors of the bird you're seeing, um, a rough size estimate of the bird, um, the habitat that it might be in, it's in the ground, it's in a pond, etc. Merlin will go out to this huge database called eBird and it will identify based on your location within about 50 miles what birds commonly show up and it will send you that information in the form of pictures so that you could say, ah, yeah, that's, that's the bird. And then there's additional information um, that you can also access through Merlin, um, maps of where birds typically are, maybe calls or songs of those birds. 
So I highly recommend you consider Merlin because first of all, it's free and it's been out there for a while. And it's a great way to get into birding because all you have to do is kind of pick out some colors you see on the bird and the size and maybe the habitat and it'll start feeding you information. You can winnow it down. Uh, if you're working with um, some of the online apps that include all the birds of the United States, it's it can be daunting to try to get it down to your Pacific area. And that's what's nice about Merlin because as I said, it goes out to the database. It looks at what's in a 50 mile radius of where you are and it feeds you information that's a little bit more targeted for you. Okay, thanks. Uh, I have a question now for Suzanne. Uh, is there an app to identify butterflies? Um, I have not used that actually. I haven't used an app to identify butterflies. Um, an app, yeah. I have not, no. Okay. But I was looking, I think there are some that you could use. Yeah. I, I, I really like that. I use it a lot because it identifies the butterfly and the host plants and next plants is that San Francisco guide, that little fold out cardboard yes. thing. That's the San Francisco guide, the local butterflies. So yeah, um, I use I that one too, but I haven't used an, um, uh, one on my phone. I, you know, I have, I have that one and I like that too, because um, it, uh, there's one that I've got that's not just San Francisco, but it's for, um, you know, our area. And that has, um, not only the butterfly, but also the egg and the, ho the host plant. Um, you know, the butterfly picture, but the caterpillar picture, I mean. Right. That's really important because it's hard to know which one it is if you, um, if you haven't seen the caterpillar and the host Especially plant. Especially if, uh, if they go through the various end stages. <laughs> exactly, um, exactly. All right, another butterfly question for you. How far do butterflies that don't migrate travel to find food? Um, well, you know, it's, it's fascinating because, of course, butterflies are all over. Um, monarch we talked about earlier will, um, you know, move in different stages, different generations up and down the, the um, you know, from California up to, Cal uh, to Canada and back again. Um, but there are some that have, uh, that live in very short, you know, just like within 50 feet or something. Uh, some of the butterflies who spend a lot of their time as larvae um, in mulch and um, they might only go for 50 feet and that kind of thing um, you know you can find it from one of these guys they will tell you but it um, you know it's just so variable because butterflies are so different the pipe von swallowtail butterfly does not have a huge range um, it's one that is um, um, you know, more local, localized than one like the Monarch. And the Mission Blue is one that stays in such a short range. Um, so it, it is very variable. You know, the Painted Lady you see all across the country. And um, so, you know, it just depends. <laughs> okay, one more question for you. Um, if I find a chrysalis should, outdoor, should I bring it in to protect it? <laughs> <laughs> or move it? Well, that's a really good question. Um, but if you think about it, just as I said in my presentation, um, in the great scheme of life, insects are a valuable, as are caterpillars, you know, for caterpillars, uh, for birds. They are, they are food for um, other creatures. And so when you think about how many eggs the pipe vine swallowtail lays or the monarch, um, you know that they must be eaten by something. And they, they may be toxic to mammals, but they will not necessarily be toxic to um, reptiles or other insects like praying mantis or something. So, um, hmm. okay, thank you. Um, I've got some other questions that aren't necessarily habitat. So um, what I'm going to do, some of these came in through pre-registration and that. So I'm gonna ask Penny and Patty they're kind of our virtual farmers market panelists to help answer them. So the first question I have is from Thomas and he is interested in fruit trees that do well in Sonoma County. I'll talk about that. Um, the thing about fruit trees, the most important thing about a fruit tree is to look at the chill factor. 
you're probably wondering what chill factor is. Um, it's a measurement of how many chill hours there are in the winter period. Um, and it's very variable by not just um, county, but, but small locations with microclimates within the county. And fruit trees, if you have a chill factor that is too high for, your, for where you live, that, that fruit tree will not flower and fruit and set fruit. So that's the first thing you need to look at. If the chill factor works, you're pretty much okay with anything in your, any kind of fruit tree. Um, however, do be conscious that our climate is changing and your chill factor may be decreasing. So that's something else to keep in mind. Yeah, um, our local nurseries tend to carry trees that grow in our area. But again, like Penny said, be very careful of those little microclimates because I know um, where I live, it gets a lot colder than it, where it might, where Penny lives in Occidental. So. Right. My, my, my limit's 400 hours and that's pushing it these days. Mm -hmm. yeah. Anything below that I can't grow. Generally apples and pears, if you're just starting with fruit trees, apples and pears in our area are a good one to start with. Maybe plums. Plums, Santa Rosa plums, great. I wonder why. <laughs> <laughs> with the Although for some reason, my Santa Rosa plum this year just didn't put out plums and usually we have a lot. So Mine doesn't maybe I should submit a question. <laughs> no, I, th I think it had to do with when they flowered. Yeah, yeah. Um, Penny, okay. I, I put oh. on the screen the California Rare Food Growers, the Redwood Empire chapter. <laughs> yeah, that's a great resource. Great organization if you have fruit trees. I really highly recommend it. I've been a member for years. Me too. <laughs> you guys ready? All right. Uh, this question's from Roger. My suckle pear has something eating the leaves. I do not see any obvious pests. <laughs> can, I, can I handle that too, Patty? Please, Penny, go. Because I have one growing in my yard. And I went out and looked at it, and something was eating my <laughs> tree's leaves too. So I actually put that question on rare fruit growers to ask them because I didn't know what it was. And not, none of, I have other, about five other types of pear, pear trees. None of them had their leaves eaten. Oh. Um, the response was to go out at night with a flashlight and see what I could find. I have, that was yesterday. I haven't done it yet, so. <laughs> that would be my suggestion too. I mean, when something's eating it, it's difficult if you don't see an insect actually on it, but a lot of times the insects come out at night, so you do have to go out with the flashlight or <laughs> you can even a critter, you know, so yeah. one of those night and, cameras maybe. Uh, Pat, also people should remember that if you take a picture, you can email it to our information desk because they want to see how the leaf was eaten and uh, the shape and that way they can give you information as well. Yeah, so they're really take good. Take a picture and email it to the information desk. That is a, a much better solution. Yeah, and you can get that on our website. That the um, link to that. Okay. Next question from Anne Marie: Does rust persist in the soil after heavily affected hollyhocks are pulled out? I have hollyhocks, and they are infected with rust. At least some. <laughs> And yes, I would take, if they have rust, I would take all those leaves off and dispose of them in the garbage, not in, the, not in your compost. And um, if you wanna try hollyhocks again, I'd try to get a disease resistant one and maybe plant it in a different spot, would be my advice. They can be, that can be tricky once it gets started. And there is a, I think we put the link um, on our, um, list of links as well. There's a, some information on hollyhocks at the UCIP, I see, or either our site or the UC site, uh, IPM site on hollyhocks. Okay. Thank you. Uh, next question from Patricia. Does the fine granule granite really prevent weeds from popping up on a walkway made of it? 
Well, nothing prevents weeds forever, but it will certainly be helpful to use something like that, uh, especially if you, you know, prepare the area where you're going to put the granite down. Um, there's lots of YouTube videos on how to do that, or you can hire a landscaper to do it. We recently did it and it, it really does help control the weeds. But the other thing to keep in mind is to try and keep weeds from going to seed in, you know, the areas adjacent to your pathways because you know the wind is going to blow those seeds in and eventually they're going to grow. Penny, you want to add anything to that? Not really. It re you're always going to get windblown bird drop seeds. So they'll be no matter what. We have a gravel driveway, there's weeds in it occasionally. I mean, I just keep pulling them. Yeah. Pull them before they go to seed. Best bet. Okay. Um Another question here from Michael. Uh, should drip lines around vegetable plants be put on top of or under the mulch I put around the plants? Daddy? Well, we talked about this a little bit. I think it depends on the size of the drip line. I've done both. With the very thin spaghetti-like type one, I usually have that more above because it's so tiny. But the mm -hmm. bigger ones, the like half inch ones, I like to put those slightly underneath the mulch. But I think you can do um, either thing. Um, what do you think, Penny? I, for me, I mulch with compost and I tend to have the um, pipes on top, I water at night, so the, the temperature, the, the pipes aren't hot by the time I water, so that's not an issue for me. Um, I, and I don't like them to show, so I always put a light, um, you know, yeah. light. No, for, for me, I, I, I want to know where they are and make sure that yeah. no chicken or dog or human has actually moved them out of place, so <laughs> I come on top. I think as long as you don't bury them really, really deep, or if you have the kind of emitter that actually is like spraying something out so it could get clogged up by the little pieces, then you probably wouldn't want to cover them up. But otherwise, I think to lightly cover them, it hasn't seemed no, to hurt. It doesn't hurt. Okay, thank you. And Guma, did you want to say something? Because I, you got a hand raised, so. Yeah, I put a link in the um, chat for, there's a database that links California native plants with the butterflies that depend on them. It's landscape.org, and then you search under that for butterfly uh, host plants, and and it'll it'll link. You either click on the plant and get the butterfly, or you click on the butterfly and get the plant. Great, thank you. Okay, um, Suzanne, I think you wanted to say something too. Yes, I do. Um, one of the best. Um, um, ID things is one called I Naturalist with a capital N. And it comes out of the um, California Academy of Sciences. And I did a bio blitz with them a couple of years ago. And, and it's really fantastic. You can take a photograph of, it could be a plant or it could be a butterfly or an insect or whatever. You take a photograph and you can um, share it with the community. And one of the scientists at the um, at the um, academy will actually um, evaluate your, 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 your guess. And it's a great way to learn the different, um, uh, different kinds of insects, butterflies, plants, or birds, or whatever. And it's called iNaturalist. So that's one of the best ones for okay. us. And it's in the, you know, we gave a list of, of reference links and I had that in one that I, I, I submitted. Okay, great. Uh, I actually, I, oh wait, I've got another question here from Savita. Uh, first year for squirrels. I'm noticing gallon pots knocked over, strange diggings in the yard. Is this them? I'm concerned about the only cherry crop we have had in seven years. Well, yeah, there's a lot of critters out there. I suggest a night camera maybe, if you can figure out what's what's there. Birds are always, you know, if you got cherry trees, the, um, I, 
we have cherries right now on ours and we keep a good eye on it and maybe we're going to make it this year. It just all depends. Um, those birds really like those cherries. You can cover it with netting. Um, that's one thing. But your best bet is to figure out what it, what's out there at night, if there's something out at night. I know rats will go up in the tree, raccoons. But the dingoes will go more likely um, skunks or raccoons. I don't, I don't think squirrels do a lot of digging, do they? I, I only ha I've only ever seen one in my yard, so. And they're, they're daytime anyway, so you would see it yes. in the day probably, where the other animals are nocturnal, and that's the ones I find the most troublesome. I don't know if squirrels would go out at night to eat. Uh, no, generally they wouldn't, um, but you know, a fox can climb a tree. Yeah. There's a lot of critters out there at night. We finally got a night camera and I was amazed. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, a lot of fun. At night. <laughs> yeah, but these Chris, things are big enough to tip pots over. So then it's, it's not a little thing. I'm well, a raccoon would do that. A skunk would do that. Yeah, exactly. You know? yeah. We recently put up our critter cam, you know, because we have some quails nesting and we think it's about time for the young. So we put it up, but what we got was a skunk performing for like about a half hour in front of the critter cam. So, you know, <laughs> so it's sometimes scary to see, sometimes we see a few cats pass through and, <laughs> and that. So it's, it's kind of amazing how much activity there is out there at night. <laughs> yeah, if you're looking to buy something, the official name is trail cam camera. Yeah. yeah. Search okay. for that. Okay, uh, let me look, let's see what else came up here. Um, and then squirrel. Oh, uh, yeah, someone said the ground squirrels, Terry, uh, are a huge problem here. Uh, I have a lot of ground squirrels on my property in Lakeport and they are notorious diggers, so much <laughs> that they are digging all around the roots of my oaks and endangering their stability. Ooh, wow. Learn something. Yeah. So I guess, uh, you know, where you live too is uh, sometimes some new problems. Uh, uh, someone actually too also mentioned that um, uh, about taking a photo of the bird or insect and upload it to Google Images. Uh, so, and also there's been a link posted on uh, ground squirrels. So, okay, I think that that is the end of the questions that we have. Um, does anybody have anything else they would like to ask before you know, we get ready to sign off? Um, if you're in the, the chat and you'd like to ask something, uh, just um, raise your hand. And I guess this, you had the Seek app is great for identified plants from Penny. Um, don't well, see I'm any hands. I was going to ask you know, okay. about the, the, links, the links that we, we submitted, where are they? Are they being listed? Because I haven't seen them. The there should there should be a link in the chat. Uh, yeah. yeah, so we have a document that has all the links that we that the presenters gave us ahead of time and all the links that have been in the chat and that will be available um, on uh, I think following the the posting of the YouTube video on our our um, YouTube's channel. Yeah. Because I think Janet uh, in the chat wanted to know about the recording on the Facebook page. Where the recording will be is uh, if you look on YouTube under Sonoma County Master Gardeners when it gets posted. Um, we have a question from Diane. So if Diane wants to unmute herself, she can ask the question. Yeah, uh, we have a number of fruit trees and walnut and a new almond tree. Um, and my question is, our peach tree, which was prolific last year, has been unable to green out. It did blossom 
nothing's happened to it. We've dug around it. We wonder if they're gophers or other kinds of uh, under the under the ground critters, because when we've tried to water it profusely, given how cold it was here and only 19% of rain during the winter, um, it, it's just, the water's going somewhere, but it's not making a difference. And it, it's also happening to our gala tree, which is along an Espagne with five other pears and uh, apple trees. But this one gala is having a lot of problems. And as I walk around those trees, there does seem to be kind of a sinkhole, like they're, the, the water may be going um, through these tunnels that are being, um, so I just wondered if anybody had any ideas about what to do about it. I, I don't know that we can save the peach tree and it just makes me really sad. It's just a wonderful tree stone. Mm -hmm. Yeah, gophers have killed a couple of them in my orchard, especially if they're young before they get really caught. Um, you might take like something to poke around to see if it gives because then you'll know there's a gopher hole there and you could trap them. Um, we trapped quite a few. Did you? What, what type of trap did you find or where did you find it? Because that's, I think, the only thing that we've got left. Well, my husband swears by these ones called the gopher hawk, but other people, I know, Penny, you use a different- I swear one. by trap line. Yeah. I, I find them very, they're inexpensive and very easy to set. And, and what are they- And called? they come in three sizes. Uh, what did you call them, Penny? Trap line. It's one word, trap line. And the one we um, use is the gopher hawk. And gopher yeah. hawk. But one, one other comment about gopher holes, if you do find the gopher that- you know, ob obviously that's great. Um, but one way or another, don't leave the tunnel to the, you know, uh, destroy it to the extent you can. You don't, Otherwise you will get water. I mean, sometimes in the, in the rain, my hillside has stuff pouring out of it all over because of the gopher hill tunnel. So are you saying that you ought, to, that you ought to knock? So we've got, um, we've got a lot of mulch on the on the land uh, where all these fruit trees are, it's a backyard, yeah, Puerto Rico and Petaluma, uh, West Side, and um, and I keep stepping down into you know maybe three or four inches that my heel goes into, and and it kind of one of them is pretty near that peach tree. So what you're saying is possibly just uh, get a uh, get and dent it and then pick and start start picking at that that place you sink in you didn't over water i hope well that that that's the question we've cut back we, we've been talking with um this basketball with uh, harmony farms uh, and now in pengrove and she was concerned about overwatering it and so we're cutting it back to what it was uh the only thought we had was because it was so lacking of rain and these winds have been so drying that yeah. it that that would be possibly part of it. Anyway, uh, but I think that gophers are definitely a part of it and I will track down, ooh, I hate to put those kind of nasty things in because they <laughs> do good aeration, you know. Diane, do you use drip irrigation or how are you, how are you watering? Drip, drip irrigation. Okay. My husband's got a computer that's hooked up all over this. Good. But you so. might dig down too with the trowel just to make sure it's not too wet or too dry. Oh, um, that's, a, that's a good idea. Yeah. And you are watering it at, at the drip line, right? As well as other places of the tree. Uh, I'm sorry, I don't understand what you're saying. Uh, do you know what I mean by the drip line of the tree? You the, mean the, the line around the tree with, yes, with the, where the roots extend, are just, well, branches extend to. Where yeah. yeah, yes. There, that's there's where there's most of the active roots are. Yeah, yes, that, that's, and, and then we've actually dug up in there and, um, and put, put the hoses down into that for, for a while. I don't want to take up any more of the time. I really appreciate your, your idea, so I will track them down. Thanks for your question. Um, I think we all have one more question, and this may be for Guma. Um, does the rhizome buttercup have any benefits that you know of, or is it invasive and should be allowed to die and then amend it afterwards? I've never heard of it. Um, this uh anybody 
we will ask, uh, is, and this is from Arlene. Uh, this is the wild yeah. pasture buttercup. Arlene, are you there? You can unmute. I'm yes, not... it's wild, Penny. Okay, it, it is wild. Yes, ma'am. I didn't plant it. <laughs> no, I, I, got, I got them too. Um, but wild doesn't necessarily mean native. No, yeah. no, right. There are a lot of invasives that are, are um, you know, invasive. <laughs> Totally. You know, use it. Maybe you could use one of the um, IDs. You know, with iNaturalist, take a photograph of it, and um, and then see what they, uh, and then they will will identify it for you. Yeah. Or submit it to the the desk. Take a picture and submit it to the desk, Master Gardener desk. Okay. Good there idea, are, guys. Thanks. Okay. There are a lot of different plants that are called buttercups. So, um, including oxalis. Mm -hmm. yes. yeah, so oh, but I not, love Exalus. Oh, I better know, mute myself. <laughs> yeah. You need more information to figure out which plant you're talking about. Uh, okay. Um, good. I think it's like 140, 146 now. So it's probably about time for us to wrap up uh, the presentation today. Um, are you out there, Cleo? <laughs> anyway, um, we, we're going to go ahead and finish up for today. Uh, again, if you haven't, if you think of a question later or in the future, or you know, if there was a question you're thinking about that didn't get answered, uh, please, by all means, go to our website and submit your question to our information desk. Um, you can also attend the next session of Ask a Master Gardener. Uh, it's scheduled for every fourth Wednesday of the month. And so the next one should be June 23rd, if my calendar is not lying to me. Um, and all of our, as I mentioned before, uh, all of our upcoming Zoom webinar talks uh, can be found on our homepage. And uh, oh, there. If you want to scan the QR code there, um, you can go and you know go to our, well, not that, but list of events and it'll also tell you what's coming up uh, and that. So uh, again, please visit our website, it has a ton of information. It changes as we find out things or uh, new research comes into us. Um, so, explore the website. You can visit the Master Gardeners on Facebook, YouTube, and Instagram. Uh, and uh, uh, like I said, go out and there's lots of reading out there. So uh, we are a nonprofit volunteer organization. So if you would like to help, please visit our website. Um, again, there's a QR code if you want to scan it uh, on that chart. And we just thank you so much for attending today's session of Ask a Master Gardener. We thank our speakers, they were wonderful. And hopefully uh, everyone is out this afternoon planting their habitat garden. Um, and please, any few questions you have, we're looking forward to being able to help you with any of your gardening uh, questions and concerns. So once again, thanks to all again. Have a good afternoon. Thank you. Thank you very much, everyone. You guys have a good afternoon, too. Yo. <laughs> Thanks. Thanks, Arlene. Good job, guys. Bye. Thank Bye. you. Bye. Very, very helpful. Most